Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corlick from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and today we're finally going to be doing the PS5 review. I mean, it's only been out for nearly a year. Why did it take so long? Well, yeah, we're going to get into all that, but a couple of disclaimers before we get started here. First and foremost, yes, the console has been out for nearly a year, and I was able to do the Xbox Series X review like the day it came out. Like, what happened? Well, to tell you the truth, as you full well know probably, PS5s are really hard to get at this point in time, so this was the earliest I could finally get it, and as soon as I got it, I worked on it, and now here we are. So, yeah, that's key to understand because since I couldn't do it earlier, enough time has passed where Sony has put out updates for this thing that have changed certain stuff. So this review comes from the perspective of someone who finally got access to it, but not until the late summer of 2021. And the reason that matters is there have been system updates that have addressed certain bugs and certain issues that I probably would have acknowledged, but now they are not in existence. So I, they're not a factor. But at the same time, with that caveat in mind, you have to remember that this is only the late summer of 2021 at the time I'm doing this video, which means that issues I bring up may be completely irrelevant within six months, a year, or who knows if some of those things get corrected. So keep that in mind. That's uh, point number one. Point number two is that for the majority of this video, we're gonna do things a little bit differently. Uh, I'm going to uh, just basically have PS5 gameplay footage throughout the entirety of this video, let's say starting now. Um, and so the majority of the time you won't really see me, you'll just hear me while looking at gameplay stuff, primarily from uh, Demon Souls for the PlayStation 5, as well as Spider-Man Miles Morales uh, for the PlayStation 5. And I, I will cut to, as you just saw there, relevant things as they become relevant. Um, so it might, you know, hopefully it doesn't get too jarring, but I figured you guys would want to enjoy that more than just looking at me for however long this takes. So yes, there we go. Let's go ahead and get into it. Now, the PlayStation 5. Okay, let's let's start with the transition phase, like comparing it to, say, the Xbox Series X and what that type of process is like. And so to really understand that, you saw that I have some PS4s on the table. I'm coming from a position of I've got PS4, I've got PS4 Pro, now I have PS5. And so what is that upgrade process like? And the best way, I think, to understand that is to understand what my PS4 ecosystem was like. I am the type of person that... We now live in a system where consoles no longer play their discs right up from the disc and you play your games. You have to install everything. This has been the way it has been since the beginning of the eighth generation. The Xbox One and PS4 both did that. The Wii U was the last console that ever played anything directly off of a disc. So that being the case, you have to install stuff, right? And we've all known this problem. So Microsoft had made it very easy for you to be able to address this because they allowed you to have external storage. Infamously, Sony took their sweet time doing it, but eventually you got external storage on the PS4. Great. And so the way I operate is I install everything onto the console as you must, but I tell it to in install to the external device. In the case of the PS4, I've been using a four terabyte external storage hard drive. Um, and the internal drive I really just use for playing stuff. And my PS4 Pro, which was primarily how I was doing things, I had actually put a one terabyte SSD in it for the benefits that come with that. And so if I wanted to play a game, I would install it to the console and then I would move it to the, the internal drive simply for playing purposes and then move it back to the external drive when I was done playing it. The reason I do this is, hey, we don't all have a ton of time to sit around and play a video game, so if you do, you want to actually get into it. But rather than sit there and be like, oh, cool, I've got some time, and now I need to like install and update for an hour or whatever, kind of kills that free time. So I want things to be constantly installed. But migrating data from one drive to the other does not take a whole lot of time comparatively. So I essentially tell it to go do that. I go get a cup of coffee. I come back. It's done. I can play my game now. I operate that way with the PlayStation ecosystem. I also do it with the Xbox ecosystem. Exactly same logic. External drive. Install everything there. Migrate it when I need it. Move it back when I'm done with it. Cool? So let's, with that mindset, uh, how was it to get an Xbox Series X when it came out? What was the upgrade process going from the Xbox One to the Xbox uh, Series X? Aside from getting the names confused, all that really was, it felt, and I said this in my video at the time, is it felt like a physical firmware update because everything basically stayed consistent. What I did was I disconnected my Xbox One X, unplugged its power cable, unplugged HDMI, Ethernet, and the USB device, which in that case is a hard drive, just physically disconnected them, 
plugged the Series X into all the exact same ports. Didn't have to change a single cable. Plug it in, turn it on, boot it up, it downloads an update here, I log into my account there, and then it basically ingests the hard drive, it populates, and boom, that was it. It was essentially done at that point. Um, so I kind of thought the PS5 would be a similar process, but and it was, but it had some extra hiccups. So let's get into that hiccup system if you're the guy who's going from a PS4 to a PS5. Um, basically, uh, when, I, when I set up to go do that, I turned on the PS5, and the initial boot-up sequence was essentially identical. If you're starting fresh, this should really not be an issue for you. You connect to the internet, it downloads its updates, and then you either create a new profile if you're a new user, or you use the same account if you want to that you used on your PS4 and potentially as far back as the PlayStation 3. It, you, know, you carry over the same account information. So I went ahead and I did that. This is where it starts to get a little funky because now you have the option to transfer your data over. Um, so I was like, oh cool, they have a built-in system for this for transferring stuff from the PS4 to the PS5. Mind you, in the case of the Xbox, everything you have is stored externally on that hard drive. So once you plug it in, you're done. Things like your uh, game saves, your progress files, in the case of the Xbox, is stored in the cloud, which is debatably good or bad. Uh, it's good in the sense that it's convenient, bad in the sense that you don't have any real control over it, but whatever, it's there. So once you connect to the new Xbox, it just kind of reconnects all that stuff and you don't have to do anything. In the case of this transfer process though, it says, okay, here you're gonna transfer stuff, here's what you need to do. Fire up the PS5 and now the PS5 is gonna go searching for a PS4 that's on your network, which means two things. A, you have to have a PS4 activated on, you know, within your home, the same one you have the PS5 on. But you also have to know something about networking. Uh, enough so that your network is open and that the devices can communicate, which in my case, not a problem. You know, I, I taught myself networking back in high school, so I keep things open enough that all devices can freely communicate with each other if I want them to. Um, but I'm an extreme case. I've, many of my friends, like, they're, they use certain devices where everything's just locked. You know, they don't, they don't have access to the routers, particularly if they use like Apple products. Um, stuff is locked and they don't have access and they can't do the, to this type of transfer. So your mileage may vary on this type of thing, but in my instance, this wasn't a big deal. So I followed its instructions, which also did mean I needed a second monitor to hook up the PS4. So I hooked it up to one of those portable monitors, followed its instructions, which was really simple. And then it went ahead and it started doing data transfer. Now what it does is it transfers a couple of different things. The first section is it transferring those save files. Again, your progress files like we just talked about. This was smooth, this I really had no issues with. That was great, very happy about the way that worked. The second part though is that it also claims it can transfer over your like internal uh, storage device. Like whatever games you have installed or apps or whatever that are compatible, it says like, I'll bring those over. Where that gets funky is like, Again, in my situation, I don't really keep anything installed on the internal drive, so this was essentially useless for me. The only things that were there were things like PT, you know, playable teaser, that whole infamous demo, which it can migrate, but it straight up tells you on a PS5 that you can't actually run it, so it's kind of pointless. Um, but beyond that, it didn't really have anything else to transfer. So it didn't transfer certain apps. It basically just goes ahead and gets the new PS5 versions of those apps and so on and so forth. So that didn't have any real point. Where it's kind of dumb is that it can't transfer anything from an external device. So whatever. The process only took me a few seconds and mostly it just, just did my save files. But okay. Can't transfer over my internal games, nor would I think that that's really that the best way to do it because that can take a lot of time to transfer, you know, potentially a terabyte's worth of data over a network would take a while. Um, so instead, to their credit, they did it like Microsoft where you just say, hey, you know what? You have all your stuff on an external hard drive, just plug that into the PS5 and you're good to go. So I was like, great, that's awesome. So after the PS5 was initialized and all that stuff and it was set up, I just took my old PS4 hard drive, plugged it into the PS5. Now, it is worth noting that that PS4 hard drive was a four terabyte uh, portable drive, meaning it didn't need a power supply, because four terabytes was completely sufficient to be a good external source for this, because my library for the PS4 is big, but not big enough that it couldn't handle that. And also, again, you got a terabyte of internal storage, so you can, you can make that work. PS5, anyway, I, we'll get back to it on the storage issues, but I plug it in, 
And it's like, okay, cool. I see the hard drive. I'm going to go ahead and, you know, start installing stuff and populating, which is what I expected from it to do, just like the Xbox Series X did. Eventually, though, it, it basically told me it was done. And I was like, great. But I ran into some obvious issues. And this is important to understand in the Xbox context. So with the Xbox, going from an Xbox One to an Xbox Series X, like I said, it has to populate. And then all your games just appear there. Now, technically, and they don't tell you this, I actually did a video separately about this, every single game needs to be recertified online in order to work offline. That is to say, you might have had a game on your Xbox One that you played a lot, and now you have it on your Xbox Series X that you just took from one hard drive to the other. Um, however, the game must be booted at least one time while connected to Xbox Live, just so the Xbox can validate the install and say like, hey, this is a legitimate copy. I hate that practice, I really do, because that's not good for the future, but regardless, it is there. It is a thing that you need. But the Xbox never tells you like, hey, this game specifically has an issue and you need to correct it. It just kind of says all your games are good, and as long as you're connected to the internet, you'll never run into that problem. But once you have certified the game, you can then play it offline to your heart's content. Okay, the case with the PS5 is it's gotta do exactly the same thing. It has to connect online to certify every single game. The difference is it does not show you your games. Instead, it basically presents every single game as an error, or at least it did in my case. So you can see here this long list of stuff where it's basically, each one of those is supposed to be a PS4 game, but each one claims it doesn't know the title and that it didn't work. Or in some cases, it straight up says it can't install them. It's just some sort of bug. And I was like, this is really frustrating. So the solution to this was I had to go in take every single PS4 game I have, every single disc, put it back in the console, and then let it recertify, which was very tedious to say the least. And it also created certain other issues that I became unfortunately very aware of. Um, so while the vast majority of my games, it was as simple as put the disc in, it detects it, and it goes like, okay, you're good to go, just run it once and you're fine. There was a substantial number of games where I put them in and I would get an error screen saying it can't play that. Even though it would recognize it, it just said I couldn't play it. And I thought, okay, the PS5 does not have flawless backwards compatibility with the PS4. That's known. It, it has, I think it, it was like 10 games or something it couldn't support. But I was like, what are the odds that like I have that many of them? I just didn't think that was the case. So I looked into it and it turns out there was a solution. I thought, okay, let me uninstall this build. Maybe it just got a little wonky in the transfer. I'll reinstall it, no problem. So Alien Isolation, for example, I uninstalled the game, put the disc in fresh, and it reinstalled. Then it worked just fine. I was like, okay, cool. That's It's just a tr glitch in the transfer. I don't like that, but it's a thing. It's whatever. And incidentally, after I installed it, it's, it's cool because it installs and it actually gives you time. The PS4, I, if it does this, I never found that feature. But when you install a game on the PS4, it doesn't tell you like how long the installation will go unless you're downloading it. You basically just have to like listen to the disk drive and say, ooh, it's spinning or it's not. Whereas the PS5, it's like, here's how long it's gonna take, like an estimation, just like the Xbox stuff does. And it also has the patch and you know, like how long that's gonna take. And I was like, that's great. One thing that's dumb though, is that it doesn't automatically go and get any sort of DLC that you already have for it. So again, in Alien Isolation's case, I had to go be like, don't I have some for that? I don't know, I installed the game, I don't know, eight years ago, but I think there was some. So then I go back and check in the archives and there it is, there's some DLC, it doesn't automatically go and get. So then I have to remember to do that, which meant every single game that I installed, I had to go back and check every single one to see if there was any DLC I had that was not there. And that happened, let's just say, a lot. It was actually really annoying. So then I had to reinstall all of that. I don't know why, but DLC doesn't seem to transfer in that process. I don't know. Maybe for other people, your luck is different. I don't know, but that was my situation. So anyway, so I go ahead and I do all that sort of stuff. And then I've got Alien Isolation running. I'm thinking it's great. Okay, no problem. Fast forward a day, I go to fire up the PS5 and I go into my archives because I'm going to like, all right, I'm picking out a game that I'm going to use for footage purposes. And I noticed that Alien Isolation is missing. And I was like, what's up with that? So then I noticed a whole bunch of games were missing. And I was like, okay. So then I put in Alien Isolation and it reinstalls again from the beginning. I was like, what? what? Why is it doing this? I never deleted it. Long story short, with that one, I did some research. It turns out this is a known issue that's existed since the PS5 launch, which is 
it randomly deletes games without your consent. It just does it. Um, it seems that those games are always the same ones, at least in my case. It, it picked a bunch of random games. All the same games I had to reinstall at the very beginning were the same ones I had to reinstall the next day. So that's stupid. That needs to be addressed. Apparently Sony did address it back in like December of 2020. They put out a firmware update that somewhat fixed it, but clearly not very well because a whole bunch of the games just have to be reinstalled every day, which is just, it's stupid beyond words that that's an issue. But okay, work on that one. That's kind of key. Um, but anyway, so whatever, that's a thing. So I'm like, okay, we get past all that stuff. And after all of that, relatively speaking, the process was smooth. So then I thought, okay, now let's go ahead and upgrade the storage on this thing. Now I'm not doing the whole internal uh, storage upgrade, which by the way, at the time I make this video, was only a recent firmware update that even allowed for that possibility. Um, but I was like, okay, I'm gonna take, four terabytes is no longer suffi sufficient because it now has to collect all of my PS4 stuff as well as uh, my new PS5 stuff. And on top of that, I now have a smaller internal storage device to work with because this is only 825 gigabytes as a base and you only get like 600 of that. Whereas the PS4, you know, I have a one terabyte SSD in it and you get access to like 800 gigabytes of it or whatever. So I was like, okay, you don't, you have less to work with and you have more data. So I was like, let's upgrade. Now, what I had, what I had access to was a spare eight terabyte external drive. And the reason I had that is that's what I had been using on the Xbox One. But when I got the Series X, I decided I'm gonna upgrade to a 16 terabyte drive, which may sound like overkill and kind of is, but I did it because it has a lot of content it needs. It, it, every single OG Xbox game that's backwards compatible, I have. Every single 360 game that I own that's compatible is on that drive. Every single Xbox One game I have, on that drive. Every single Xbox Series X game I have on that drive. Not to mention all of the updates that came from Xbox One games that got enhancements through the Xbox One X program and the Xbox Series X upgrades. In other words, lots of stuff. But to top it all off, I also have more Xbox games in general than I do over PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 content. But that said, that meant I had now a spare eight terabyte drive. Let's plug it in. I look it up, it says yes, PS5 is totally capable of having an eight terabyte drive. Stupidly, you cannot have two external drives at the same time on the PS5, whereas the Xbox Series X will actually allow you to have two simultaneous 16 terabyte drives, which means you can have 32 terabytes of external storage on an Xbox Series X if you want to, plus the one terabyte of internal storage. That's a lot. I'm not even close to the 16 terabyte limit, not even, not even within that hemisphere. But still, I have the option. I don't have to deal with it. It's future-proof for quite some time. Now it's time to do that for the PS5, right? Well, not so fast. Because like I said, you only get one. And I was like, that's okay. I have one. I plug it in. To, you know, It's like, okay, it's got a format. That makes sense. But then it's like, oh, your drive isn't supported. And I'm like, well, why the hell not? Because the minimum is 250 gigs. No problem. Well above that. USB 3.0. Not a problem above that. Power requirement. Not a problem. It's got its own power supply. Not a problem there. The maximum it supports is eight terabytes, but it recognizes the drive as 8.01 terabytes. In fact, it even told me it was just 12 megabytes too big. That's comically stupid because any other device will not even recognize it as a full eight terabyte. They all keep it much smaller than that. So I was like, that's dumb. So I did some research into this and I thought, okay, you can format it a couple of different ways and that might trick it into working. Didn't work. Uh, you can try partitioning it and just kind of shaving off a couple of those extra megabytes and see what happens. Didn't work. I googled this. I ended up finding out that this is a known issue with the PS4. Um, the same exact issue has existed since 2016. Because uh, Sony allowed the PS4 to support up to 8 terabytes of external storage. But the exact same problem where it recognizes a lot of 8 terabyte drives as 8.01 just to make them not work is a known thing. And they apparently carried that flaw over to the PS5 for reasons I do not understand. Um, so what that means is I have to continue to use the four terabyte drive because I'm certainly not gonna go out and buy a new eight terabyte drive and just hope magically that that one is compatible when I have a perfectly good one just sitting there unused. So really all I can do is hope that at some point Sony says, okay, eight terabytes is a joke compared to Microsoft allowing 32. Okay, so at least some point they'll hopefully update that size to anything, even like 
500 megabytes bigger and I would be good. You know what I mean? Like, it's just stupid. But hopefully they upgrade that and then I don't have to deal with it because I, I really don't want to do any other... I don't want to try and buy a new drive just for that. It's just stupid. So that's one of those dumb limitations that has no reason to exist. I do not get it. You can fix that one really simply. But that, all that means for me as the end user, the customer is like, okay, I understand I have this comical limit with the PS5 that I do not have with the Xbox Series X. So it motivates me to get more content for the Xbox Series X instead, which is not what you want, Sony. That's a simple bug fix. You can, you can fix that. Like those are my two biggest criticisms is the storage problem as well as uh, this uninstalling glitch, which is frankly unacceptable. But okay, now all of that's done. So let's, let's talk about a few other things. Let's talk about some positives because I'm sure that people want th that type of information. Let's talk about the controller. I gotta say this controller, phenomenal. I absolutely love it. Like at first, in the first couple times I ever held it, I thought it was like, okay. Um, but after I actually played games with it, like the ones you're looking at, man, I, I, this, like, I just, the weight is just right. The, the configuration is great. Uh, I love the color even, like USB-C, like everything about this to me is like a flawless controller. But where it really excelled is it's got a little speaker in it, which really enhanced, I usually don't like gimmicks like that, but that one totally was great. Like it really enhanced the atmosphere of the game and the vibration in the controller, same thing. Usually vibration to me is just kind of a thing and it hasn't really impressed me since, believe it or not, the N64. That was only because that was the first time you ever experienced it. This, the vibration in this felt, for lack of a better word, intelligent. It felt like it was really trying to finesse you into feeling like you're in that game because the vibration is smart. I don't know how else to put it, but I really like that controller. I think that that is fantastic. Um, the sad part about it though is that it's unique to this console. It doesn't work on the other PlayStation hardware. And the only reason I bring that up is if you use a PS4 controller, if you take a PS4 controller, you can actually use that on a PS5. It's a little gimped, but it does work. Uh, and actually the PS4 controller even works on a PS3 gimped again but does work unfortunately the ps5 controller does not work on a ps4 nor does it work on a ps3 it's only works on this um, which is too bad because it's a great controller one other thing that happened to me that was a little odd was uh, every time i would turn my tv on the ps5 would turn on and i was kind of like what the hell uh no it makes sense there's a feature in there it's an hdmi linking feature so this is what it looks like so you can really easily turn this off but in case you're that guy out there who noticed that was happening and you didn't want it to be yeah it, you can just turn that off no big deal a couple other things that i think are worth noting about the console itself um before we get into a few other details is um like media playback if you have the disc edition that is because there's both a digital and a disc edition of this console uh the disc edition will play your games obviously but it will also play 4k blu-rays it will play regular blu-rays I try. I wanted to test region coding with Blu-rays, but unfortunately, I was unable to because I don't. Own, I don't own enough 4K Blu-rays. And of all my Blu-rays, my standard ones, um, it was able to read both regular Blu-rays as well as uh, BDRs or burned Blu-rays, uh, which is great. Um, but I could not test the region coding because all of my international Blu-rays happen to be region free. So I don't really know if the Blu-ray drive is region free or not. I did test DVDs. The DVD drive is not region free. Um, it played all my American stuff, no problem. It even played um, stuff that was at one point European, but I had made region free. So I've bought a lot of European DVDs over time where I, I basically clone them so that I have like a DVD-R version. And the only reason I do that is to strip out the region coding. But when you do that, it doesn't change the video frequency issue, meaning it remains in 50 hertz. So infamously when I would do that, and I've said this, you can go back and look at some of my really old videos and I've talked about this, but when you do that, Xbox hardware never cared. It was like, okay, we'll just convert it to 60 hertz and you're good to go. But PS3, for example, would not. It wouldn't support it. PS2 would not support it. Um, I don't remember if the PS4 does or not, but the PS5 does support that conversion, so you're good there. But that said, if you have an original European DVD, in the case of myself, because I'm an American, it will say, hey, that's a DVD, um, but we can't play it because of the region coding. However, they give you the option to change the region coding on the console, which at first I was like, oh, cool. That's kind of seems like an extra pointless step. I don't know why you need me to do that, but you have the option. But then it says the catch to it, which is you can only ever do it four times in the life cycle of the hardware. I don't know why you would give it such a comical limitation. And I, and I know they're not unique to that. I've seen that it's always four times and it's usually, 
I assume there's some licensing reason for that that I'm not aware of, but not that people are really looking at this thing for as a DVD player, but hey, you never know, you might be that guy who wants that information, so now you have it. Um, it does not play music CDs, just like the PS4 did not play music CDs, neither does the PS5, which is still one of those head scratchers, because it's like, dude, I know it's antiquated tech, but F the Xbox Series X plays music CDs and no problem. And it's Sony's format, or at least partially their format. It's like they're paying themselves. I Whatever. They don't support it. That's that, that much I can say. Um, so now on to the console itself. So the design is one of those things where you either love it or you hate it. And I want to talk a bit about that because it's, it's not really a secret anymore that the design was intended as a digital-only platform. If you compare what the physical edition versus the digital edition looks like, You'll, it's pretty obvious from the, the case design that the digital one was like very uniform, but with the disc one, they just kind of slapped that disc on the side. Hence, it kind of looks like a tumor disc just kind of hanging off of the console. And people have actually taken apart the PS5 and concluded that if you were an engineer told last minute you needed to slap a disc drive onto this thing, that's exactly how you would do it because it's like a Band-Aid solution of the, the way they added it. Um, and which tells me, and it kind of tells everybody, Sony did not intend to have a physical edition of this console. It's just obvious at some point they kind of got cold feet about that and decided to do it. I think they were really betting that the digital-only version would be the superior version, and I think Microsoft had was kind of gambling the same thing. Microsoft just approached it differently. In their case, they gave you the full-on bundle for physical, but they gave you a much cheaper, albeit weaker, digital edition of the console. And I think that they too were hoping the digital version would be better because frankly, both companies make more money if they're having digital versions because they control the entire market of how you get your games at that point. It's one of the reasons I'm vehemently opposed to digital content. But anyway, regardless, um, we know now that the physical editions seem to be the ones that are performing better, which is great news for guys like me because I've said it for over a year and I maintain this, at some point, both Microsoft and Sony will eliminate the version of their console that is performing poorer than the other. And I think the first two years of this is really just to determine, is this the generation where we do away with physical media or not? And fortunately, it seems like that's not the case. It seems like physical media is winning out this generation, which is great. Um, so, I mean, if you look at the four versions, the Xbox Series X, the Series S, the PS5, and PS5 Digital, the only one you can actually readily go into a store and buy right now is the Xbox Series S. That's the only one that's ever in stock. And between the Sony consoles, um, it seems while the PS4 digital or PS5 digital is still hard to get, it seems it's not as hard to get. Um, so that's that's great news. That being the case, I think that I would bet on Sony within a year or two redesigning the PS5 around the disc version and exterminating the the digital version because this really was not meant to be a disc based machine. I would I gather they'll do a PS5 Slim. The disc drive is more convenient and nicer. Because the version you have now, if you own a PS5, chances are you already know this. But if you don't, there's a good chance you look at it and you're not entirely certain which direction you're supposed to put the disc in. Because the data side, does it go that way or does it go this way? Historically speaking, the data side would go towards the majority of the hardware. Not the case in the PS5. The data side actually goes that way towards the air. <laughs> it's a little weird. Um, and it can be awkward like when you're, I mean, I keep the console standing up. So it's kind of awkward like when you're using it because you just it never feels instinctual. And if you're like, that's an over-exaggeration, even Sony themselves screwed that up. There's that ad where they put the console on upside down. Like, it's clearly not meant to actually have a disk drive. They just kind of did it. So I, I think that they'll change that at some point. So whatever. Um, potentially, I would say wait for that. And I also might say in general, potentially just wait. These things are really hard to get. But they feel a little prototypey for the issues I've already cited with, you know, uninstalling random games and all that sort of stuff. But it's not like this isn't a good console. Do not misunderstand me. I think it's just a couple firmware patches away from being great. Because um, the gameplay stuff was fantastic. I loved that. Especially Spider-Man. I think that was really, really fun. Um, so I, I like it. Do not misunderstand me. But... Let's talk about it comparatively to PlayStation 4 stuff. Like, if you're that guy who's going to upgrade, what you know, in addition to all the stuff I already talked about, what is the actual performance like? Playing PS4 games on a PS5 is a little like going from the PS1 to the PS2, but playing your PS1 games on the PS2. It has built-in improvements that make the experience better. Better load times, um, you know, buffering abilities, at least in the case with the PlayStation 2. In general, it just kind of makes the experience better. So I'll cite a very specific example. Um, 
Alien Isolation, I, I only know this because I had to research that game and why it was uninstalling. On a base PS4, that game runs around 24 frames a second. On a PS4 Pro, it targets 30, but it doesn't guarantee it. It can drop under that. On a PS5, it's a locked 30 frames per second. And that's just one case. It's a case-by-case -case basis on each game. Some games will perform a lot better. They have patches built specifically for them and so on. Other games, it's a generic improvement. And other games, and unfortunately I don't have footage of this, but I did test several games where I turned it on and I got an error screen basically saying like, hey, this will work, but just so you know, this game works better on a PS4 than it does on a PS5 or something to that effect. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Also, depending on your library of PlayStation 4 games, you might actually have some that are free PS5 upgrade eligible. I only had one, which was No Man's Sky. I put that in and it started installing. It's like, hey, you know, you have the PS4 version, but good news for you, you can have the PS5 version for free if you want to download this update. It just becomes the PS5 build of the game. And I was like, fantastic, sounds great. Where it gets disappointing is like Spider-Man, uh, the, the, the precursor to the Miles Morales game was completely remastered for the PlayStation 5. But if you have the PS4 version put it in, it does not care about that. It, and I, I know if you look that one up, there's people pretty salty about it, and I don't blame them. I am too, because those games are fun, and it's whatever. But, um, yeah, so that's that's kind of it with that. I'll, I'll put on some PS4 gameplay. So we got Shenmue 3 running right here, which I love this game. I know it's not everybody's favorite by any means, but I did a whole review on it. You can check that out if you want to. But this was a game that I know was enhanced on PS5. Uh, I forget what the specifics are, but I believe it ran a, a much more stable, faster frame rate. I think it actually stays at 60 FPS. Um, although I should have mentioned this at the beginning, all the gameplay footage you're looking at is, you have to keep in mind, is downgraded to 1080p in the capture process. It also then is captured footage, so it's encoded. It's gone through editing software, so it has to be re-rendered. It's then exported and then converted by YouTube. In other words, rough approximation of what you can expect. But that is to say, PS4 stuff in general seems to work better on the PS5, and your ability to notice that will really differ based on which version of the PS4 you had, if you had one at all. So the biggest difference would be like if you have the base PS4 or the slim and you jump to the PS5, it will be more noticeable. If you've been using the PS4 Pro all this time, then the difference will be negligible to your eyes only because you got really used to it already and now it's just going a little better. Does that? I'm sure that makes sense, but that's pretty much how it works. Um, now back onto the console itself, from a hardware perspective, I know I'm kind of jumping around, but you know, sorry, it's <laughs> um, the PS4, the PS5 console itself. On the back, it has two USB 3.0 ports, one of which is where you can put a hard drive. As I said, it doesn't support two currently. My guess is they'll add that eventually, I hope, or at least expand the current one. Um, but that also means they gave themselves a second USB port for whatever purpose. Currently, it kind of supports two hard drives in the sense that you can do the backup and transfer feature. So had my eight terabyte drive been supported, I would connect both to the PS5 and it would take all the data from the smaller drive and move it to the second one. It just doesn't let me use them independently of each other. Um, they also probably, that's how you connect things like the PSVR and so on. I'm not really sure because I don't like VR. Um, and you never know, they might need it for other ex possible accessories, whatever. Uh, it has the ethernet port, nothing special there. HDMI output, that is the only way to get video out of this thing, and thankfully we're well past all the alternatives. Although I'm surprised that if, you know, it's possible in the future we might start getting PS5s with DisplayPort on them, who knows. Um, and then the power supply, which this is one of those things that's really, 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 really nice, and nobody gives it enough credit, so I'm going to. It uses that figure eight power supply. And the reason that's so great is that cable is so universal. It comes with like everything. So it's like, even if you lose the cable or you, you probably have other ones set up, you just have those around. It's, it makes it very nice. I hate proprietary power supplies. I hate them. Um, so this one is super nice. I mean, if you think about it, there's a version of every single PlayStation console that uses that exact power supply. You can use the cable that came with the PS5 on the first version of the PS1. You can use it on the first version of the PS2. You can also use it on the third version of the PS2. You can use it on the second and third versions of the PS3. You can use it on the first uh, version of the PS4 for sure. I'm not sure about the Slim because I don't own one. Um, but yeah, I think it, I don't remember offhand, but I'm pretty sure it's also the same power supply that works on the, yes it is, on the PSX, the Japanese PSX. But since we're talking about the history of all Sony's consoles, wow, this is the biggest PlayStation console that has ever been made. 
Um, it is bigger than the PS3 grill. It is bigger than the Japanese only PSX DVR. It is a monster in size, which again adds to my thought process that they're going to shrink this down and probably give it a more logical disk drive at some point. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, dude, Sony has redesigned every single hardware they've ever made. Even their failed ones, like the Vita, they still gave two versions of. Like, it's, and then we already know now they have already released an upgraded, I say upgraded very loosely, version of the PS5 that uses a different mount and so on and so forth. But that's just them tinkering. That's just what they do. So I, I have no doubt you're going to get an, uh, an altered version of the PS5 at some point. It's just a key, like, how much of that they really do. Um... But yeah, on the, on the front, you also have two uh, ports. You have a USB 2.0 port, which seems really just for the purpose of syncing the controller and charging the controller. I mean, I guess presumably you can charge other things with it, like your phone or whatever, if you want to. But that seems to be its point, because it's, it's not a USB 3.0 port, or at least it doesn't seem to be. So it's not really intended for anything else. But there's also a USB-C port there, and that, I imagine, is an extra super speed port, because it's USB-C specific. So maybe, but I honestly don't really have any other way of testing that. Um, so in short, not that this has exactly been short, I think that's... That's about it. I believe the console itself is also region free because um, I don't know. I don't have multi-region PS5 games, but I imagine they didn't restore that because I think we would have heard about that by now. Um, it is not backwards compatible with, say, the PS1, PS2, or PS3. Um, yeah, so it's overall, I, I think it is nice. Uh, I, I should mention, though, I had very few digital games. The only digital games I had were acquired through when, you know, freebies like companies send me codes or whatever and I check them out. I don't buy digital stuff. I, the transfer process for those was not easy. Um, partially because I'm not as familiar with the PlayStation ecosystem. Like, the Xbox ecosystem is like, here's everything you have digitally. Do you want them back or not? Uh, PS5, it's like I kind of had to go searching for them. Um, and then some of them would install and other ones wouldn't. And it was just kind of a pain. I just don't understand why you would go out of your way to do the digital stuff. But that's partially my own experience. Yours, again, may vary. Um... Yeah, I, I, I think that's about it. Overall, if you're asking me, like, should I get a PS5 if I have the chance? Again, that's on you. It is an expensive machine. Um, it's I would say it's the best PS4 that's ever been made. <laughs> um, but the actual PS5 stuff, it's too early. Like, it, we haven't got enough PS5 content. That said, the two games I do have here, I really enjoyed playing. Spider-Man especially, fantastic. It was a very smooth, wonderful experience in the actual gameplay. It's just kind of the setup of it is wonkier than it needs to be and i think a few firmware upgrades will really help with that um but it still has the same like you know issues that the xbox does with online certification of course the cmos battery bomb is hasn't changed guys i know we kind of all forgot about that but that's still a thing and it's in there um so that sucks but uh whatever yeah i think uh i think that'll about do it for now if, if there's one takeaway here it's if you're an Xbox guy, odds are upgrading to the Xbox is the way you're going to go. If you're more of a PlayStation guy, odds are upgrading to the PlayStation is the way you're going to go. If you're into having both, just do both. Um, I don't really know how else to say it. If you, if you ask me to pick one right now, I probably actually, to be honest with you, you probably would take the Xbox Series X over it for reasons I've already cited, mostly down to storage and just friendly use. But it's not like this thing doesn't do some things really right. I do really enjoy the ability to have my saves offline and have more control over them and all that sort of stuff. Neither of them are perfect. They're just not. They both have flaws. But I got to say, Microsoft's tad better at responding to those flaws and adjusting for them. The Xbox when it, Series X, when it came out, did not feel like a prototype. This is almost a year out and still feels like a prototype because of how many just basic things are wrong with it. And that's after they have made patches already. So that's word of caution there. Uh, do I regret getting it? In absolutely no way, shape, or form. I think it's awesome. Um, and I look forward to many years of playing on it. Um, I just hope that it continues to be the disc-based endeavor that I want it to be. So there you go. Hopefully that uh, this was informative to you guys. Hopefully this is educational, what have you. Uh, thank you guys very much for watching. If you could please like, comment, subscribe, I appreciate that. Check the social media stuff for the description in the description for following me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, all that sort of stuff. I appreciate that as always. Uh, I want to give a shout out here to a guy named Lodmot because he was cool enough to hook me up with Demon Souls uh, back in the day before I even had the console. Um, and I also just want to say thank you to everybody for being patient on this. Uh, the video is essentially over, but now I'm just going to tell you a little personal story that has to do with it. Um, and I mentioned this in my unboxing video, but 
the reason it took me so long wasn't just that these consoles are hard to get. It was also the method by which I wanted to get it. I wanted to get it from Best Buy specifically, and the reason for that was um, my mother passed away a little over a year ago, and when she did, I was responsible for shutting down her accounts and all that sort of stuff, and one of those included her credit card. So when I shut that down, or I was in the process of it, I looked at it, and it's like, you know when you use a credit card, you earn points for things? Um, she had earned a ton of points that were very generic. You could redeem them for any number of things. You could get cash back or you could get gift cards. I was able to, and they would basically say, if you picked a gift card, we'll give you more for it. So I was like, okay, I'll do this and I'll redeem Best Buy gift cards. And it wasn't just, hey, cool, then I can don't have to pay for it, whatever. It was more of the sentimentality that this was, in a weird way, my mother buying me one last console. Which meant a lot to me because, as I've said in the past, like, all my video game consoles when I grew up, you know, logically so, they came from my mom, right? And um, so she can't do that anymore. She's gone. But in this weird way from kind of beyond the grave, she was like, you know, here's one more. Go out with that. So that meant a lot. But it meant I had to get it through Best Buy. And I was willing to wait for that to be the case because it's a very emotional thing for me. Um, and before I whelp up, I'm just going to say, once again, thank you very much, everybody, for watching. Please, again, like, comment, subscribe, follow me on all the social media stuff, and I'll see you all later.